I'm Annie Fisher, the Vice President of the American Literary Translators Association. I'm excited to open this video commemorating the longlist, shortlist, and winner of the 2020 National Translation Award in Poetry. 2020 marks the 22nd year for the NTA and the sixth year that the award is conferred separately in poetry and prose. The NTA is the only award in the United States to include a rigorous examination of the long-listed translations against the originals. We are grateful for the crucial work of our anonymous expert readers. Welcome everyone. We are excited to have you here to celebrate with us. The judges for the 2020 NTA in Poetry are Ilya Kaminsky, Lisa Katz, and Farid Matuk, who judged over 60 titles this year to select the longlist, shortlist, and winner, who will receive a $2,500 prize. We will be hearing from Lisa Katz with the blurbs for the shortlisted titles, and then we will go to Farid Matuk for the announcement of the winner of the 2020 National Translation Award in Poetry, followed by a brief conversation and reading with the winner. Please feel free to follow along in the awards brochure found in the description, and we encourage you to purchase these titles from the bookshop.org page, also found in the description. When you do, you support local bookstores. Engage with us in the comments wherever you're watching and tag us at Lit Translate on Twitter and use the hashtag Alta43. And now I'll turn over to our judges. This is the short list for the National Translation Award in Poetry for 2020 in no particular order. I'd like to apologize for any mispronunciations I make of names and long words, and mainly to offer my congratulations to these fine poets and translators. Hysteria by Kim E. Dum, translated by Jack, Jake Levine, So Se Un, and Heji Choi from Action Books. One of the co-translators of this good-humored and confrontational book notes in the afterward that the style of Korean poet Kim Idum is intentionally excessive and irrational. Her speaker is a hipster who makes brash statements about quotidian experiences that may occur in any crowded city. In the title poem, a woman being groped on the subway imagines her revenge. Quote, I want to kill the motherfucker. If only I could go down to the sandy beach on the red coast, moonlit. There, beside the cool waters, I would lay him down, if only." Edom turns her glance on her specifically Korean milieu as well. It's an intriguing, illuminating volume. The Last Innocence, The Lost Adventures by Alejandra Pizarnik, translated by Cecilia Rossi, Ugly Duckling Press. The directness and lucidity of these translations of multilingual Argentine poet Alejandra Pizarnik present her work to us with its enigmas intact. For example, ashes in which the sky described by the poet is then claimed to be watching her and the atmosphere owns emotions and a face which one might expect to belong to the speaker. Quote, night splintered into stars. It watched me stunned. The air scatters hatred, its face beautified by music. Pizarnik has often been translated into English. Rossi's work avoids verbosity and is less Latinate than others, and more suited to Pizarnik's minimalism, which then requires the reader to think. The Winter Garden Photograph by Reina Maria Rodriguez, translated by Christine Dykstra with Nancy Gates Madsen from Ugly Duckling Press. Rodriguez's poetry is both lyrical and investigative, captivating and thoughtful. It is interested in metaphysics, but also able to, able to deliver the philosophical ideas in precise, elegant language. Dijkstra and Gates Madsen have done an excellent job in bringing Rodriguez's prosodic nuances into an English that is as fresh as it is delicate. This book, perhaps more so than any other collection published this year, captures the inner workings of the human mind. The Battle Between the Frogs and the Mice, a tiny Homeric epic, translated by A.E. Stallings from Paul Dry Books. A.E. Stallings translations are always a masterclass in music making. Here, she offers us a lively and crisp version of a classic text 
we meet the mouse named Crumb Snatcher, killed by the reckless frog, King Pufferthroat, starting a war between species. This ages old parable is well known, but A.E. Stalling's charming and often hilarious version makes it come to life by a word choice and rhyming couplets. Translators should know at least one language well, preferably their own, W.H. Auden suggested. A.E. Stallings, a virtuoso of English prosody, gives us yet another example of how it is done. Room in Rome by Jorge Eduardo Eilson, translated by David Shook from Cardboard House Press. Some works don't begin or end in the dissolution of translation, which, rather than being poetry's unfortunate devolution, is its origin and life force. Finding their fingers already tingling to touch that loose weave, poets like Jorge Eduardo Eilson can fling their attentions out across poems long or short and return having woven the unexpected into the prosaic. David Shook's translation allows English readers to notice how the knots in Eilson's weave gather dread, rage, linguistic self-awareness, and somehow joy. Tell Me Kenyalang by Kula Grassi, translated by Pauline Fan from Circumference Books. Translator Pauline Fan, in collaboration with poet Kula Grassi, offers an English version of Tell Me Kenyalang that complicates national categorizing schemes of world literature. Grassi intersperses verse written in Malay with phrases of Kaya and Kelebit, just two of the languages spoken by different ethnic and cultural groups residing in the nation state of Malaysia, allowing some Kaya and Kelebit to remain untranslated. Fan and Grassi give readers rich multilingual evocations of multi-ethnic storytelling, ceremonial songs, ritual incantations, and dream weaving. But this is no museum. Fan's translation renders the pulse of a living poet's contemporary generative attention to contemporary generative moments, offering us a text that is narrated alive. And this year's winner of the National Translation Award in Poetry is Hysteria by Kim Doom, translated by Jake Levine, Sosun, and Heji Choi, published by Action Books. I'd like to welcome Jake, Son, and Heji to turn on their cameras now. Hi all. Yay. Thank you for joining us and congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so we agreed to have a quick conversation. Um, I wish we could spend more time together talking about your wonderful work. But, um, but to start us off, uh, could one of you speak to what drew you to Kimia Doom's work into hysteria in particular? Yeah, um, I think initially for me, what I enjoyed about Hysteria when I started working on it was like this obvious quality of irreverence and like one dimensionality almost like the poems are very explicit about both of those qualities, almost like insistent. And at the end of one of the poems, dress rehearsal, uh, the lines are like, I'm single layered, there's no me inside me. And also when we interviewed Kimi Dim, like that was something that she felt very strongly about. So I think that was like the initial draw. But as we got into the translation process, I started thinking like, that's not quite right. That like, despite the explicit insistence on flatness, that there are many places in these poems where the ambiguity is really rich in a productive way. Um, and like that's part of why translation took so long to like sift through these layers that like the poem is insisting isn't there um, and to determine how to like get that across in English. And even like the irreverence or the hysteria that's there but at the same time there's also this like subdued under the surface quality. Um, and in the first poems like in the first poem which is about a server getting her order wrong there's a lot, there's like a big emotional reaction to that, that like reads as like hysteria, but like the external reaction to that is almost nothing. And so I think there's like a interesting like balance between what is being proclaimed to be there and like what is actually there. And it like even after like sort of the 
more obvious surface level attraction of hysteria fades, I think like I'm left with questions about like why it was necessary to insist upon a certain flatness. Like what situation is she, is the speaker responding to where flatness is advantageous or even necessary? That's great. I hope we can touch on that in, um, in a couple of the, the other questions. Um, you mentioned it was a long process. What were some of the challenges and rewards you encountered in working as a team of three translators? I think like the most rewarding moments were when we like were on call to talk about like a part of po a part of a poem, especially in situations where no one like had like the answer mm -hmm. and we could like throw things around and it felt like it was valuable to me in the sense that it felt very permissive. Like we would like I would have an idea and I'd be like, well, that's like not good or like that's not that's like too wild and then I would throw it out and like almost as a joke and then we would sort of pick up on it and even if we didn't use it like it would like start a conversation about like what's appealing about that that was eventually useful. Yes we do have different like cycles of motivation and sometimes uh, when we come back to it to discuss it together we don't remember exactly what we were thinking at the moment when we were very excited about the poems but I think uh, when we do come back and um, have these discussion like a very engaging way we try to like um, justify our choices to the other translators and in that process we have to verbalize our thinking and I think that's very like it's a good learning um, experience and like the externalization of your thinking process is very helpful um, On that note, maybe the three of you could comment, what are your hopes for the next 10 or 15 years of Korean literature and translation in the U.S. or in, English, in the English-speaking world? I know that Soen so and I just translated a poet. We have a book coming out in like a month, Kim Min Jong. Um, Heji's been working on a book for a few years now that's coming out in the spring by Moon Bo Young. I think right now in particular is maybe the most exciting moment for English translation of Korean literature. Not that Korean literature didn't always have great writers, but right now there are so many young great translators. And so there a lot of those translators are just now coming out with their first translated book. And so I think the future is like super, super, super bright. Maybe like, you know, a Korean, a Korean a book of uh, translation from Korean will win year and year and year. Yeah. That's wonderful. Do, do you two want to add anything to that? Thoughts for where Korean literature might go in English? Kind of. <clears throat> um just have like a personal hope that like the genres that are being translated will also expand. Um, like I think like within poetry, like there is this like expansion of like what counts and what is supported and celebrated. I want to translate um, web comics so badly. <laughs> so that's sort of like the project that I, I'm hoping to work on that I hope lots of people will be like interested in working on as well. I think we all we all also like have discussed, maybe this is like an aside question, but we've also discussed like how difficult it is for us to to love like the K-pop phenomenon. And kind of, kind of in a way, it's really important that all these like punk rock great poets are being translated from Korean to give people like an alternative view of like a, a different kind of culture. Um, because K-pop takes up so much of the attention and space. I think at the same time, like the reason Korean poetry also garners so much attention is because of K-pop and uh, other areas where Korea is, you know, very powerful right now. And poetry is just kind of like piggybacking on that, <laughs> that success. Um, that wave. I think I think they're piggybacking on us. In particular, on Kim Yun Poetry. <laughs> right. We're we're responsible for BTS. Oh, I'm just saying. We play a role. We play a role. 
And on that inflammatory note, we can we can maybe conclude the conversation. Congratulations to you all. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Hysteria. I want to rip you apart with my teeth. I want to tear you to death on the speeding subway. Hey, you groping. Hey, hey, hands off. I feel like I'm ripping, like I'll tear apart any second. I want to scream, throw a fit. But I take my hands and push it deep into my gut. Breathe. Deep. Don't fucking touch me. I said stop leaning on me. You're driving me nuts, what the fuck? The leather in my body begins to strain. Is it a fox or a wolf? I'm about to pop. Flowing blood like a lunar halo, blood stains that bleed through blue sheets. You think that's instinctual? Because of the full moon? Shut your mouth. Truth speaking woman, if you know the truth, keep it to yourself. This is the gospel of filthy humans. Periodic bleeding, stomach cramps, I won't stop. I'm complicated as hell, but people try and try to get inside. I'm an insider me, not an outsider. You mumble even in your sleep. Sudden hemorrhaging, blood flowing, a world with a big door. Closing, opening, repeat, repeat. A wheel that stops and stops as it turns. I need a new route. I need to get out. I need a heavy duty maxi pad. What to do with this passed out fucker? With his hand in my coat, this fucker is talking in his sleep like he's re reading a scribbled letter. I want to kill the motherfucker. But what if he's my lover? If only I could pick him up by the back of his neck with my teeth. I would leap off this train and sprint over the tracks. I would head to the darkest part of the night, my wild hair flapping. If only I could go to the sandy beach on the red coast, moonlit. There, beside the cool waters, I would lay him down. If only.